Hey everybody, welcome to the wonderful world of Remnant Radio. My name is Joshua Lewis. In today's program, I've got Hans Borsman with us and we're going to be discussing Lexio Divina, Divine Reading. It's going to be an exciting program. You guys stay tuned. You are watching The Remnant Radio, a crowd-funded show where we interview pastors, teachers, historians, and theologians from different churches and denominations. My name is Joshua Lewis, and this is my co-host, Michael Roundtree. Together, we want to help you break outside of your theological echo chambers. If you're interested in learning about history, theology, or the gifts of the Spirit, this is the show for you. Hey, everybody. This is an exciting program for us today. We have a bunch of videos online already about uh, scripture, whether that's textual criticism with James White or uh, Dr. Van Hooser talking about uh, how we approach the, the, the scripture uh, with the sola. So there, we, we, we read the scripture, sola scriptura, it's our authority, but we read it through the lens of sola gratia. It's the grace of God that's revealing scripture to us. We have interviews uh, with guys like Mark Ward and others that we tackle. So I will drop the playlist of those kinds of scripture readings uh, below in this video. So if you're interested in learning more, and you're like, hey, this is a great program. I want to dive more into that. You can find that in the link of the description. Uh, also, I would encourage you, if you're interested in supporting the channel because of the content we're producing, uh, you have ways to do that. You have the top link there of the video as you give a one-time gift on PayPal or you can be a reoccurring giver on Patreon. As low as five bucks a month, you'll get access to extra content. Like this Wednesday, uh, we're going to be doing a training uh, on prophecy. If you want to do uh, learn about pro the prophetic, we have a, a content on Zoom that's going to be released there on Patreon uh, at 5.15 p.m. Wednesday Central Time. So that's going to be exciting uh, as well. Uh, last but not least, I want to encourage our audience to check out the... Whoa. You are watching. That is the benefit of having live content right there is you accidentally hit the play button twice. I want to encourage you to check out the Word and Spirit School of Ministry. Uh, registration opened just the other week. Uh, it'll be closing here in the next two weeks. So if you're interested in registering, go check that out. Without further ado, Michael Roundtree, how are you doing, buddy? Doing well, man. Doing well. Uh, over here in the Oklahoma City. Uh, so great to have you guys, Hans. It's great to have you on the show. Read a few of your books and read Pierced by Love and uh, ready to talk a little bit about this Lectio Divina. Before we do, though, uh, Hans, if you could just tell us maybe a little bit about yourself, about your ministry. I see you're wearing a clerical collar that tells us a little bit of something about talk to us about uh, just kind of where you do ministry and what that looks like for you. Yes, absolutely. Um, I uh, am a professional theologian, so I teach theology at Neshota House Theological Seminary in Wisconsin, which is an Anglo-Catholic seminary. Um, before coming there four years ago, I taught for uh, 14 years at Regent College in Vancouver. Um, my interests um, vary widely. Um, I'm interested in patristic thought, especially in the way that the Church Fathers interpreted the scriptures, which is a topic that's closely related to what we're talking about today, Lexi Divina. Um, I am interested uh, also in uh, the topic of the beatific vision, seeing God face to face in the hereafter, a topic that also is connected to what we're talking about today, Lexi Divina. And um, I'm interested in 20th century Catholic thought. Um, I'm not an expert in any of these things. Um, I'm, I'm dabbling in most of the topics that I'm that I'm looking at, but doing so with uh, with a lot of a lot of interest and hopefully with some benefit. Um, I am married to my wife Linda, who's a retired school teacher. We have uh, five children and fifteen grandchildren all over the place. That's fantastic. Uh, can we maybe just start off talking uh, about your book here, uh, Pierced by Love? Uh, as you guys know, it's a Lexham Press book, and as a Lexham Press book has potentially the best paper ever put into public books uh, for public consumption. So uh, check out this book, pick it up. Again, I'll drop the links in the description if you want to pick this up. Uh, Hans, can you tell us a little bit about divine reading or Lexio Divina as you understand it and what the contents of your book contain, those kind of four steps of this uh, journey of reading scripture, reflecting on it, praying through it, that kind of thing? Yes. Um, you uh, you refer to it as divine reading, Josh. And um I think the reason for for the for the name ultimately is um, that the scriptures themselves are divine. Uh, that is to say that the scriptures are are divinus. They are they are they're what we today would often call holy. They are set aside, and in that sense, they're divine. They're meant for a certain divine purpose. Therefore, um, the the scriptures are given to us by by our gracious God to bring us into His presence and to take us into the divine life. Um, 
And so the divine scriptures have a divine purpose. And that begins with simply reading uh, the Latin term Lexio, hence Lexia Divina, begins with reading. That's the first of, of the four, four steps of the ladder, as it were, as, as they're often depicted, a ladder. So that's the first step, Lexio. And through repetitive reading, with meditation, with silence, um, one, one begins over time to make the words of the scriptures one's own uh, meditation, um, memorizing the words, um, internalizing them, chewing on them, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All of that is meditatio, meditation, the second step. Um, and through that meditative process, you cannot but encounter um, yourself uh, as you've come to know yourself in Jesus Christ, in and through the words of the text. Um, and sometimes what you see is not so good because. Well, you're confronted with your own shortcomings, your own sins, uh, your own weaknesses. Um, so there's a lot of, 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 of soul searching going on that comes our way through meditation and a lot of prayer that comes our way through meditating on the, on the biblical text. And hence, the third step is oratio, prayer. So we move from lexio, by, uh, lexio via meditatio uh, to oratio, prayer. Um, and uh, in much of the tradition, that's then um, the, the purpose of that is to see God, um, seeing God face to face it is, in other words, contemplation. Um, our ultimate goal as Christians is to see God face to face. And we, we get a glimpse of that, I think, in, in, in this process of Lexi Divina. Okay. All right. Um, so one, one thing I want to come back to is, I was just taking notes there. Uh, I was, uh, I wanted to come back to when you talk about the scripture as divine, um, help some of our listeners, viewers understand what you mean by that. I could hear maybe somebody push back and say, well, Hey, John five thirty nine and 40, Jesus says, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, yet you refuse to come to me that you may find life. And and so someone would say, well, the scriptures are, are written by God and they point us to God, but they're not the same as God. And so that, uh, so what do you mean when you say that uh, the scriptures are divine? Yeah, thank you. For, thank you for that, Michael. It's a, it's a very good question, an important question, I think. Um, let, let me first say that the expression, the divine scriptures, which I, which I often, often use, have begun to use in part through my, through my work on this book. It's, it used to be a very common term in much of the Christian tradition. Um, and, and not only the pre-modern tradition, but also in, in earlier, earlier Protestant, uh, in the earlier Protestant tradition, many people would often speak of the scriptures, would commonly speak of the scriptures as the divine scriptures. Um, it seems to me that we have, we have um, too often rendered the reading of scripture um, to, to involve a process that, that would, would make it seem to be like any other book. And the scriptures definitely are not like any other book. Mm -hmm. um, so so it, it's first of all, a, a term of reverence towards scripture. Sometimes we mm -hmm. still hear the term holy, holy scripture. This is holy scripture. And um, that really does the same thing. Um, briefly already, I mentioned earlier that uh, when I talk about the divine scriptures, it is the holy scriptures. That is to say, they're set apart. Holy, to be holy means to set apart. Um, mm -hmm. and, and to be divine in that sense also means to be set apart. Um, so the scriptures are set apart for a particular purpose. They're, they're in that sense, not in some senses, of course, they're like any other book, but in that sense, they're not like any other book. They, they, have, they have a very particular purpose, and we are to read them in line with that purpose. Um, I should also say um, that there is an even deeper sense, perhaps, that I don't explore in the book. But since you're asking the question, let, let mm -hmm. me briefly go there. That there is a sense in which you could say the scriptures are defined in a, in a deeper sense. So, for example, um, St. Maxim is the confessor. Um, makes the point that the that the eternal word of God and, and, and before him, uh, St. Augustine does much the same thing. 
that the eternal word of God comes to us in human words. And that these, these human words, the words of scripture, carry in that sense, carry in that sense, the, 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 the word, capital W, word, the eternal word of God, the son of God mm-hmm. himself. You can never read the words of scripture as if they were mere words. Um, they're inspired by the spirit so as, to, so as to carry the very presence of the eternal word of God. Amen. Mm. That's so that I think that kind of leads me into my question. I suppose you'd mentioned in your book this the two kind of uh, maybe I'll call them ditches. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but ditches on both sides of the interpretive landscape. One that views the scriptures through a naturalistic reading, a naturalistic lens, and with complete materialistic eyes and naturalistic eyes, um, we would approach the Bible as some historical document, reading it in a strictly historical grammatical way because it's only natural information that I'm digesting that can be comprehended through natural logic and reason. And then the other side of that pitfall could be a Gnosticism that trying to spiritualize everything in the text. Can you maybe explain to us how Lexio uses both and the, the, the Lexio Divina motto that this divine reading kind of bridges the gap between those two ditches? Yeah, that's a very yeah. helpful way of, of, of putting things. Uh, thanks for that, Joshua. Um, my my understanding of, of uh, interpretation of scripture um, uh, has 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 reacted mostly against the first pole that you described, the materialistic pole. Um, that is to say, um, too often I think we've come to um, treat the biblical text as if it as as if it meant to give us historical knowledge. That is to say, in our interpretation, what we're interested in primarily, and sometimes only, is authorial intent. So that once we know what the author meant back then, um, we now know today what the text means. That's a, that's an error, I think. We do not know at that point what the text means. Um, for, for several reasons we don't. Uh, a, because history uh, always only gives us probabilities, never more. So if, if as a theologian, you claim to be primarily a historian, and increasingly I feel that also within evangelical circles, um, um, people who should see themselves as theologians see themselves primarily as historians. Uh, we, we know at that point that, that, we're, that we have a problem because his, his history um, gives us varying degrees perhaps, but gives us only probabilities. Some, some are more likely, some are less likely, but they're not sure enough, not certain enough to give us the foundation on which to, to build the Christian faith. What we need for that is we need the church. And the church's faith, the tradition of the church, um, and and its interpretation of the Holy Scriptures, um, and and the second thing I think I, I want to say about this strong focus about historical readings of Scripture is that it leaves us um, it leaves us unfulfilled. Um, we would have to take a second step after that, and that is application which is what a lot of preaching do, does. It first does the exposition, historical, and then it moves on to application as a separate thing. And um, I think that's a duality, perhaps a dualism, if I wanted to be very critical, but it's a duality that I think is unhelpful. Um, I think we need to move um, through the scriptures themselves from the outset realizing that, that Christ is a starting point the theological starting point of our reading, not something that comes in later, but the theological starting point for our reading. And 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 from the start, we also need to keep in mind that the, the ultimate telos, the aim at, at, at which we, at, at, uh, for, for which we reach in our, in our reading of the scriptures. Okay. Uh, so one of the, one of the things that you, uh, that you talk about uh, is a, and maybe this ties into kind of what you just said, that Christ is a, a starting point. Uh, you talk about scripture as being sort of like a sacrament and helping us avoid these ditches of materialism and Gnosticism. So uh, help us understand what you mean by the word sacrament when you talk about it with regard to the scripture, and then maybe help us see how that provides a solution to these ditches on either side. The dilemma, yes. Um, I often, indeed, talk about the scriptures as being being sacramental, 
Um, and what I mean by that is um, that uh, the scriptures are, are um, as it were, the, the outward sign uh, containing the reality, the reality being really present in it, a sacramental language, of course, real presence. Um, the, 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 the scriptures being the sacrament that always already contain uh, the real presence of our Lord. Um, so uh, when, when the church fathers, beginning with, with Irenaeus in the second century, um, talk about um, the scriptures as, as um, the field within which uh, we find the treasure, thinking of, of Matthew 13, 42 here, uh, the scriptures being the field uh, in which we find the treasure um, and, and the treasure itself being Christ, then the implication is that the treasure is already there. It's the race in Latin, the reality. It's the aim of our reading, and, and, and that aim is not something we impose. We don't construct it. We don't later impose it. We find it there. We're digging for it, and we find it there. And so when we find in our reading and our meditating on, on the Scriptures and our praying over the Scriptures, when we find Christ there, when we see Christ there, um, we, we find him there as, as the sacramental reality of this outward sacrament of the scriptures. Um, um, what, that, what that helps us do is two things, as your question I think implies. Um, it, it first of all helps us, helps us realize that there's no such thing as pure history, say a pure field with nothing in it yet. Um, there's no such thing as a purely historical reading of, of, of the text so that after that maybe we come with Christology or the application or whatever have you. Um, and, and, and so it, it, aim, it, it, takes, it takes aim, this sacramental reading, at a, at a materialist understanding or at a, at a purely historical understanding of what it is that we do in exegesis or in our interpretation of scripture. Um, and, and secondly, what it also does um, is it, it allows us to say that that um, it, um, it, it is not as if as if we can come at the spiritual reality of 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 um, interpretation by by leaving behind somehow the history within which the Christian faith is grounded, um, with, with by leaving behind um, what the text has done um, through the centuries, but but. Um, uh, and what Gnosticism does is it tells us um, th this, the particular givenness of things, including the biblical text, is, is ultimately relevant. And what you see in the Church Fathers and in the medieval theologians that I look at in this book is, no, the text matters and the words of the te text matter throughout so that you can't just do whatever you want in your interpretation of Scripture as though it didn't matter, as though the text itself the, the, the God-given text itself and the canonical context did not matter at all. This is... Okay. Uh, help, me, help me with uh, the historical grammatical hermeneutic as we, as we talk about that. Because if I were to talk to like a Lutheran pastor or I were to talk to uh, maybe a Reformed pastor, uh, in their own way, they're going to try to aim at making Christ the center of every text. And I, I would say that lots of traditions right now, I think maybe are even trying to get back to that. I'm, the, the, the reformed space is like Christ has got to be the center of our sermon. Um, I'm reminded of a lot of the Lutheran uh, conversations right now with law and gospel and saying, hey, um, the law drives us to Christ. The gospel drives us to Christ and like he has to be the chief end. And, and when we look at all of these texts of scriptures, they, they point us in that way. Reformed uh, thinking is going to say, hey, if this is an Old Testament passage, it's it's foreshadowed. There's lots of typological language that they're going mm -hmm. to use. Um, I even think of the guys at the Bible Project right now, Tim Mackey uh, and others who, man, what they're they're trying to do is show how the Bible is this cohesive picture that points to Jesus. So if I were yep. to hear you and say, like, hey, okay, so I've, I'm talking about this other, it feels other than what is a lot of normal preaching or even normal Bible reading can you maybe even contrast what you're describing against some of those other models? They would all, I yes, think, the, yeah. that I've referenced, hold to like a historical grammatical hermeneutic, but they would still allow the text's purpose, right? So, yeah, this is what this text means, but the purpose of this text is to point us to Jesus um, in, in finding that meaning. How would Is it different? Do you think it's close? 
and then how so would you would you contrast it yeah yes that, that's a very helpful question uh, let me first say say joshua that uh, so that your your listeners and, and viewers have a sense of of what this book is about um this book is not is not a polemical book at all um, sure. it's true that in one of in, in one of the chapters toward the end i talked very briefly about materialism and, and gnosticism and uh, so as to give the the uh, readers an impression as to where i'm where i'm headed in this book and what it is that i'm doing but the, the book as a whole is is not at all polemical and it purpose i purposely sh um, stay away from it in this book it's not like i never engage in polemics i do um i do um but in this book i purposely do not it has a, it has a different aim um so I, I just want want your your listeners to be aware of that so they don't get the the, the impression that that this book is meant as a sort of as a way of saying hey hey um here's something else we've been doing this wrong um let, let, let's go for this approach instead um that's not what this book is about uh at, at all um what what this book wants to do instead is it wants to go back to the to the history of the church uh, and and it, it wants to say look ordinary ordinary reading of scripture um would be lexio divina that there's nothing special about that it's not just for monks it's not just for elites it's for us all and and it is in fact the way that scripture has mostly been read the way in which scripture mostly has been read uh through the centuries that's that's what what the book does positive and then it aims to help help readers uh, with ways uh, in, in which this might happen um now it's true of course as you're rightly suggesting in your question um that that means criticism implies criticism behind behind what i write in the book of of, of what what i might see as problematic ways of treating scripture um and so when when you talk about certain reformed and perhaps lutheran modes of of, of reading scripture it's true that that my book says, well, um, a, a, a sacramental way of reading scripture would, would look at this somewhat differently. Um, it's, it's very true also what you're saying about how, um, how interpretation of scripture within a, let's call it a redemptive historical uh, reading of scripture, reformed, reformed approach to scripture might, might look toward Christ. Um, I grew up reformed um i grew up uh, in a thoroughly redemptive historical context sermons always pointed to christ and and the reason is no doubt that that the um preachers had been had been taught and trained in their seminaries to read scripture christologically in the sense that you just described um that is to say the 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 the, the biblical text always pointed to christ um christ is always the telos always the aim and so the reader therefore also has to always always seek refuge in Je in jesus christ there's a lot of good there's a lot of good stuff in that and, and i'm very grateful for for it frankly having having had that in my own tradition and upbringing um and yet i think it is not complete so some of the examples um that, that you have in mind i think in your question uh, tends to allow for and in fact insist upon typological relationships between earlier say earlier accounts of scripture and later accounts so if you for example take genesis 18 um the near sacrifice of isaac the binding of isaac and you you relate that to um to the sacrifice of christ upon the cross um the kind of kind of preaching that you may have in mind the kind of exegesis that you're talking about um would would probably see see in many cases at least would see in through, through grammatical historical reading of the text certain similarities topology right has to topology has to do with similarities and dissimilarities would see certain types um there certain similarities between between what's happening in genesis 18 and what what is happening in the sacrifice of christ on the cross um i i think that's rich i think that is that is that is true um the question is really how do we account for the relationship between type and 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 what is often there called anti-type um how, how do we account for that relationship and on, on, on this earlier understanding um, we account for the relationship by recognizing that the sacrifice of christ is the archetype not just the anti-type not just the later type but the original arche the original the archetype it always was already there 
um, it's not not just that the biblical authors say Matthew or Mark or whoever um, sees sees that there is a certain a certain that, there, that because there is a sacrifice uh, we we may we may draw certain parallels certain similarities between the earlier and the later later account. It is that the two are ontologically linked. In fact, it is the case that that the earlier earlier account happened because of the latter. Abraham nearly sacrificed his son because God sacrificed uh, himself upon the cross in Jesus Christ. Um, so, so there is a sacramental relationship with the two, not just an outward similarity between two separate events, like you might have X and Y, two separate events. Of course, the two are, are chronologically, historically separate, but theologically or ontologically, um, they are embedded in one another. They're sacramentally related. Okay. Um, well, and I, I do, we're going to kind of pretty soon here jump to kind of walking through the practicals of Lectio Divina because I definitely want our, our viewers to walk away with here's what this looks like to actually do. Uh, I'm also wanting to spend a, just a teeny bit more time on the spiritual interpretation because probably the majority of our viewers are evangelicals and less familiar with that approach. And, uh, and so like, let's, let's say for instance, uh, okay. So you were talking about, you know, what we would call typology connections to Christ and his achievements in the last days. But, but when we talk about spiritual interpretation, so for instance, in your book, you talk about, um, I, and I can't remember who it was in church history that used, uh, that, that read Noah's Ark allegorically to speak of maybe levels of meditation, like the different layers within the Ark. Yeah. Uh, help me out, Hans, who am I thinking it, of? It's that... Hugh of St. Victory you're thinking about. Hugh of St. Victory. Right, right. So I know that the average, uh, the average evangelical viewer, if they read about that and like, okay, these layers represent like different stages of meditation or whatever, like they're thinking, I, I don't know. Can I do that with any verse? So they, there is a concern that will, that will arise uh, for the average evangelical of this, this becomes detached. Is there, uh, can I run this into like doctrinally impure directions? Hmm. Can I, uh, can I become detached, uh, overly detached through a spiritual interpretation or how does that, how is that mitigated? How do we, how do we approach a spiritual interpretation without running into a ditch? Yeah, that's a very legitimate question, I think. And I can certainly see how you come to that question when you, when you read in my book about Hugh of St. Victor and, and the, um, and the, the three or four ways in which he he interprets the Ark of Noah um, allegorically, anagogically, and and um, uh, anagogically. Like, oh, sorry, allegorically, tropologically, and anagogically. Um, so, in other words, Christ um, and and the Church and and um, and our moral lives. Um, so it 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 may sound to modern ears very arbitrary. And that's, that's the, the um, key objection that people often have against the type of exegesis that um, the Church Fathers and medieval authors embarked upon, in, in, including Hugh of St. Victor in the 12th century. Um, I, I understand that. Um, and, and is there a danger in that? Um, yes, there are dangers all over the place, um, including in, in allegorical exegesis, most definitely. So if you were to were to um, um, be a lone ranger and not subject your, your own exegesis to the to the um, teaching of the church, um, then then you you might be a loose cannon, and you you could mm -hmm. you could shoot a lot of of, of 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 cannonballs all over the place that would cause a lot of damage. Um, mm -hmm. Allegorical exegesis. Um, can become a, a free for all, and, and can become something that 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 does do doctrinal damage indeed, and that also does moral damage of all kinds. Um, mm -hmm. Just because something is allegorical doesn't mean it's good. <laughs> you know, uh, mm -hmm. I, I can I can see all sorts of uh, allegorizing that's really damaging, spiritually damaging, all sorts of ways. So no, don't don't please don't hear me saying as as you know. <laughs> 
it's allegory and, and, and therefore it's got to be good. No. Um, so, so and, and, and conversely, of course, you know, um, that, that's true also for, for historical exegesis, right? Um, if, if, you're, if you're a lone ranger and, 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 and you think, you know, what, whatever the tradition prior to me said about, about exegesis, um, I, 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 I think they just didn't understand the text at all. And so, so I, I'm the one who truly, tr truly understands the passage, and and um, I'm not going to be bound by the constraints of, of history of tradition. Um, I, I rely on my own uh, intellectual prowess, and, and I will show you now finally what 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 the true authorial intent was. Um, I mean, I can well, not just I can imagine. I know what sort of damage can and and, and often has been done with that with that approach as well. Any sort of exegesis, any, any, any approach to exegesis that we might want to take, whether it be strictly historical or whether it be, be, be um, wildly allegorical, it, 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 it both can do all sorts of damage. Mm -hmm. um, so, so um, and, and I should also say, um, don't hear me please as, as, as talking against, against history or against the importance of, 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 of literal meanings of the text. It's, but it is true that the, that the uh, earlier tradition of the church um, had a, a, a much, um, I, I almost want to say much more playful approach to the text than we tend to do. In, in modernity, um, we, we've become scientific, quote unquote, also in our reading of scripture. We've imported imported um, categories from the natural sciences uh, in, into into the way that we read Holy Scripture, and 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 sometimes we've said that really is the only thing that gives us gives gives us the true meaning of the text. You see, when you read Saint Augustine, um, I'm, I'm just teaching a course right now on participation, and and I, I've assigned I'm assigning there. Augustine's first homily on, on the Gospel of John. It is a marvelous, beautiful, beautiful homily. But you know, there and, and also elsewhere, like in his in his uh, commentary on Genesis, for example, his, his literal commentary on Genesis. You know, time and time again, he gives us three, four, sometimes five possibilities of interpretation of a certain text. Um, what he's really doing is he's saying. Look, here's one possibility. Here's another way of reading the text. And then sometimes he says to his readers, this is in a sermon, for example, right? He, he will ask, he will ask, ask his, his, his congregation, does anybody have another better reading perhaps? Um, please, your graces, tell me, <laughs> he'll ask. And, 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 and I, I will be instructed by you. Um, now, he does not mean with that, that any old interpretation goes. Or that, that, that we can allegorize however we like. We're constrained by the teaching of the church. And we're constrained in various other ways as well. Um, but what he is saying is, is this teaching a building? St. Gregory of Nyssa, whom I also love, fourth century church father, he will say, does this, does, is, is this reading, does it have usefulness? Ophileia in Greek. Does it have usefulness? Does it, is it utilis is it in, in, in Latin, right? Um, that is to say, is spiritually useful, um, and 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 um, so so allegorizing um, has to do primarily not with finding whatever meaning we like, but has to do primarily with with looking for the treasure. That is to say, it primarily has asks the question, how can we see Christ here? Hmm. Okay. So I've got. You know, I, I I told you this at the top of the show. I've got background, and I'm with Michael. We got to get into the give us the four stages. We're only thirty minutes in. We're halfway, so uh, this will be my last my last question on the allegorizing uh, bit. I grew up in a classical Pentecostal tradition, and and people who watch the show know we're still charismatic, we still believe in the gifts. Um, but a lot of that came from that tradition, specifically the space that I was in. There was a lot of allegorizing the text. Um, on a couple of ways, one, an allegorization of the text that that seemed to be novel to church history. And, and this kind of, like as you were just saying, um, the gentleman, again, I'm not super familiar with, but you're like, hey, he, he's got this interpretation of Noah and the ark and this being three levels of meditation. Uh, 
you know, was he in line with the church history when he made that claim? You know, cause I'm, I'm pretty Protestant. I don't know if you can tell. Um, so I'm, I'm saying, well, <laughs> is it just, is it just elephants all the way down? You know, like, are we just infinite regression? Like these thoughts had to have come from somewhere and either they're coming from objectivity and we're building them upon objectivity or someone allegorized the text for the first time. And then other people just happen to agree with that allegorization. Um, you know, so like, did he have a church mm -hmm. father that he was standing on the backs of when he was making that statement and was church history mm -hmm. guiding him or was he appealing to some kind of authority on himself? So, so, you know, as a Protestant, I'm going on what, by what standard on what, what authority, you know, like, like everyone's going to yeah. say, I have yeah. the interpretation of this. So I go, okay, well, is there infinite regression behind that kind of statement? Um, and, and then I guess, I guess the second kind of follow up to that would be, um, that on what grounds you know, what, what would you say? Are you, are you advising maybe like a quadrilateral of you need the, the, the objective kind of historical aspect of this? You need to be able to have a Christological, it needs to point to Christ. You need to be like listening to the spirit, open to that, and then, and then submit that to history. Like, I'm just, I'm just curious, like what kind of um, rubric would you give people so they're not yeah. just groping along the, law, the walls when trying to allegorize? Yes, great questions. Thank you, thank you, Joshua, and, and and I love your pushing back. So, so let let me first say, if if my answers don't quite suffice your viewers, I, I'm gonna I think recommend that they pick up um, either Scripture as Real Presence, in which I explain how how patristic exegesis functioned. Um, that will give a fuller answer to your question. And, also, and Hans, I can I? Have, can I take a pause real quick and let people know I'm asking these questions because I'm really interested in them. Like I really like this book and you need to pick it up. This is not me <laughs> pushing back. Like I'm genuinely curious. Like I want to know how this works. So I want to make sure people hear me when I'm asking this question. <laughs> Go ahead. Keep going. That's, that's great. Thank you, Josh. Okay, um, sure. And, and so so I, I would, I, I, ex, I expand on this kind of question uh, a lot in scripture is real presence. And in my, um, in my book, sacramental preaching, um, I, I offer a number of sermons um, in which I um, engage in what I think of as, as, as preaching from the text sacramentally. So people can see whether it's, it's, it's arbitrary or not, uh, how, how it might function, how it might be done. Um, so, so that just so that if people want some more, more background, they, they may find it there. Um, now in terms of just trying to answer your question, um, let me first, first, um, turn the tables on historical, on, on a strictly historical exegesis. So, so when, when beginning with the 17th century, and particularly in the 19th century, um, exegesis became a historical discipline for the most part. Um, it became increasingly clear um, in retrospect, it became increasingly clear that, that exegesis was, was not constrained in proper ways in that historical approach. So if, if you're asking the question, and, 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 the way that we, and the way in which that became clear, I should say maybe, the way in which that became clear is by the fact that um, we're always wanting to supplant the previous reading. The only reason you might have within a strictly historical mode to exegesis, the only reason you might have for writing um, a commentary is because you think you have a new reading of scripture. You finally now have um, the, the, the right historical understanding of that particular text. Um, and and the, the, the divergence, the wild divergence often of, of, of interpretations of the text within uh, critical historical as well as grammatical historical exegesis is, 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 is um, I, I, I think sometimes, um, let me put it this way, it is the differences there, the divergences there within strictly historical exegesis are far greater, and therefore the arbitrariness of that approach is far greater in actual practice than the allegorical exegesis of the Jewish fathers in the Middle Ages. There's far more homogeneity in the interpretation of the biblical text in the earlier tradition than there is since the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries. The reason for that is that allegorizing is constrained by the tradition of the church. Um, so you're asking about Hugh, how, how would he have done that? Um, now, I do not know the sp specifics um, of, of, of Hugh's um, background of the reading of the scriptures uh, on, 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 the, on the Ark of Noah, 
but I can well imagine. So one, one thing to do when, when, you, when you're doing a sermon, when you're preaching a sermon in this approach, one thing to always do is to, to check a number of, of patristic and medieval predecessors. And what you'll see invariably is that there's lots and lots of similarity and overlap um, between between the various various preachers or commentators of that biblical text in the in the patristic and medieval periods, um, I can well imagine. I do not know in this specific instance for sure, but I can well imagine when Hugh thinks of of the ark um, that he has in mind um, the biblical notion that that the apostle Peter talks about that that the ark is 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 that which saves us. Um, and 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 that it saves us today through baptism, and hence when he thinks of the ark, he cannot but think of the church. Um, and when he thinks of 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 the ark as church, along with the scriptures themselves, um, and 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 along with Saint Irenaeus already in the in the second century who who elaborates on this, um, that that he also looks to Christ, and knowing from Saint Augustine that Christ and the church are one. The totus Christus, um, he, he will he will have a Christological reading of, of the ark, and he will know that the ark is what takes us to safety. It will take us to eternal life, to eternally be in the presence of God, and so there will be an anagogical element uh, element there at the very end. So I, I can hardly imagine, in other words, although although Hugh goes in great great detail, no doubt, um, but but it is never. And, and sometimes some of the details, some of your some of your listeners may say, "Well, isn't that arbitrary?" The, the, the great detail to which to which Hugh goes here in in his in his reading of the Ark. Yes, it is. Um, and and frankly, in my preaching, I would not follow him in that in that detailed in in the de- in the details of some of his exegesis. Partly simply because our, our, our my listeners wouldn't be used to it. Not necessarily because it's wrong. Um, the, the main point to be made here is that none of it is arbitrary. Once, once you accept that, that the ark is the church and that you're related to Christology and that you're related to the eschaton, um, some of the other details are simply filling in part of the larger structure. You find that with the, with the church fathers and the medieval theologians time and time, and time again. Um, what may strike us initially as very arbitrary um, is in fact a detail that falls into place because, or once you have accepted the broader structure of the biblical text that that author has already has already embarked upon for for other reason, for other reasons. It's not to say, so it's not to say that it never goes off the rails. Yes, it it can, and yes, it does. Uh, much like historical exegesis can and does go off the rail. So this is not, again, a plea for, for any and everything that, say, uh, Gregory the Great has ever written and, and what has, has, has ever allegorized. It, it, it is simply to say, um, usually, for the most part, like if you, if you listen with, with a voice, with, with an ear that says, I, I want to hear what they have to say, and I, I want to see why it is that they're doing things, you'll actually find that there is a, a theologic at work, and 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 that the exegetical details are grounded within the broader theologic. You're muted, Michael. Michael, you're muted, buddy. My bad, my bad, my bad. Okay, let's get into a little bit of the Lectio Divina itself, and maybe we can get just. I think this could help us get super practical. Let's pick a verse. I don't know. Psalm 27:4, or Mary and Martha. I know you talked about them pretty extensively in your book, but uh, or pick a passage that you would prefer, but maybe just walk us through those four steps and what it would look like practically applying Lectio Divina. Do you think, could you do that sure. for us? Yes, I, I, I love Psalm 27. It's, it's uh, perhaps my favorite Psalm in all of scripture. And um, in the face of, Me of too. his enemies. I won't but... tell the sons of Quran. <laughs> <laughs> In, in in the face of of um, of, of uh, enemies that want to oppress, um, um, the psalmist says that he will not fear because because he, he puts his trust in God, and and specifically he, he puts his trust in in being with God and in the presence of God, um, 
seeking the face of God uh, in, in the temple, for that's where he sees the face of God in the temple. Um, so if, if, if you meditate on the verses, um, thy face, Lord, will I seek, on, on, on those words, thy face, Lord, will I seek, um, then um, you, you, you can read the psalm a couple of times. You particularly, particularly perhaps read this, this particular phrase, this particular clause, a number of times and, and, you, and you sit with it. And what you would do in Lectio Divina is you would, you would ask yourself certain questions, certain, certain questions you cannot but ask, I think, as a Christian. Um, and you, you ask, what does, this, what does this say? Thy face, Lord, I will seek. What does this say about, about Jesus Christ? Um, um, and 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 as you meditate upon this, um, it, it would seem that that all sorts of, of of passages about seeing the face of God would jump to mind, and seeing the face of God in Jesus Christ uh, would jump to mind. Um, um, First John three two would 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 would, would come to mind. Um, what the Mount of Transfiguration. Um, the Mount of Transfiguration has jumped to mind as well. Um, oh. The the um, the um, uh, uh, Moses going going walking in front of or sitting in, in the rock and, and 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 seeing the Lord not face to face but seeing his back, him pleading with the Lord um, that he might see him face to face. And in the same context, actually, right before that, in Exodus 33, I think it is, uh, he, he already has seen God face to face. So why is he saying that he wants to see the Lord now face to face? Um, you, have, you have the tension there of St. Paul, 1 Corinthians 13, 12, right? Um, and now we see, but in a, in a mirror, in enigma, and we shall see face to face. Um, I, I loved what John Calvin does with, with that face to face seeing of God, where, where, where for him, it's not an either or, either we see God or we do not, that is to say his face as an objective thing that's just either there or that's not there. Oh, for Calvin, that, that's, as it was earlier for Irenaeus too, it's, it's a gradual um, coming to know the Lord. Um, and and, 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 and through, through the history, God more and more, through the history of, of, uh, that God goes with his people, he more and more, shows of himself, that is to say, he shows more and more of, of, of his face. Um, so when we, when we in varying ways contemplate God, um, we're, we're anticipating seeing, seeing God's face most intimately. And as you think about that, you think, so where have I been lately? What are, what are the things I've watched lately? What did I see on the screen lately? Um, where have I gazed that I shouldn't be gazing? Um, have I been with the Lord? When was I last with the Lord? Um, it, it might lead to all sorts of self-examination. Um, I, might, I might tear up. The language of, of tears is huge within the history of Lexia Divina. I might tear up over my sinfulness. I might worry about my lack of repentance, my lack of tears. Um, I might become upset at, at our, our culture's inability or refusal to turn to the face of God in repentance. Uh, something is desperately needed in, in our culture, I think. So, so it's not just about me as an individual. It can well be about other people specifically or the culture as a whole. It can be about the church, where the church is at in terms of its, its, its contemplative um, state or, or, or lack thereof. All these things have to do with so ecclesiology, um, with, with Christology, and of course, ultimately with, with see, seeing God, God's face in the eschaton, so the anagogical meaning. Um, any preacher, I mean, Peter Lightheart makes an excellent point um, in his earlier book, Deep Exegesis, that he says, these four, these four levels of meaning, any preacher worth his salt actually in some ways, uh, either consciously or not, but any preacher worth his salt will, will, will actually go through these 
four stages. Preaching, therefore, or preparation of the, of the sermon, of the Sunday morning sermon, is actually simply, simply um, an extended form of, of Lexi Divina. Meditating upon the scriptures, praying over them, um, and, and, and discerning, discerning the face of God. One more comment on this maybe, and it's this. I, I love St. Anselm's proslogium. We, we know that usually as, as a um, argument for the existence of God, which in some sense it is. And, and it's, 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 it's a very cool argument, actually, I think, the ontological mm -hmm. argument for God's existence. Um, it's, 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 it's convincing within a certain context. But, but what, what it actually is, it's, it's in the form of a prayer. He prays to God as a monk within a, within a monastic setting. And, and um, it's not, it's, in other words, it's not pure reason that is, is, is that he's engaged in. At the very beginning, he, sa he says to his fellow monks, look, go find yourself a quiet spot and, 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 and read the biblical text. And then he quotes Psalm 27, as he does once more later on at a crucial point later on in the proslogium. He quotes Psalm 27 again. Um, the, the entire process of, of the proslogium is a searching for God, to, for the face of God, that is to say for the presence of God, and, and, and in that sense, when, when the psalmist says, Thy face, Lord, do I seek, to me that's beca that has become um, like a, a shorthand almost of, of the entire process of Lectio Divina, what it is, what it's meant to do, and what I think St. Anselm embarks upon there. Um, and, it, it, it's, and it's also a shorthand, shorthand, I think, for the entire Christian life, for the entire Christian pilgrimage. It's, it's a search for the face of God. Mm. Amen. That's good. So I, I, I like Psalm 27. It's probably my favorite Psalm as well. Um, let's just walking through this. I can grasp most of these points and, and I would imagine this is probably the hardest one to describe. So that's why I'm going to ask you to describe it. Um, and I also find just personally, this makes sense to me experientially, but I would also have a hard time explaining this last point of the Lectio process because um, it, it's, it's, I, it's, hap it's, if it's happened to you, you want it to happen to other people. I remember, um, uh, early on in my like real heavy pursuit of the Lord, spent a lot of time in prayer, a lot of time in the word, a lot of time meditating on these things, picturing these things and being kind of spiritually raptured, if you will, but not having any context for it. And then reading, you know, the cloud of unknowing, the Bernard of Clairvaux and Teresa of Avila, and then realizing, oh man, like this is like, what happened to me wasn't unique, which was actually really good for someone who was trying to make sense of all of their experiences, realizing that the, the Christian tradition had done this and I just stumbled upon it accidentally. Like, that was fantastic. Um, but could you maybe explain this to us? So Lectio, we're reading, we're going to meditate, we're going to pray through, but this last con contem contem again, can't pronounce Latin, but this, this for this, yeah, yeah. Thank you. This, this form, this, this former, uh, uh, process of being, lifted up beyond myself to God. Like, is that an experience? Is that a feeling? Is that my thoughts are filled with the spirit? Like, could you maybe explain what that is in, in good luck on the front end of that question? <laughs> yeah, I cannot, do, I cannot do a very good job of that, I'm afraid. Um, but, but I, I can say a few things about it. Um, first, um, Yes, it has to do with experience. And yes, it also has to do with feeling. Um, Bernard of Clairvaux, um, whom you mentioned, um, certainly talks a great deal about experience and feeling. And especially the language of experiencia is huge, um, it, it, particularly in the 11th, 12th centuries. It's, it's very big. It, it carries a certain danger, I think, um, because, the, and, and the danger is this, um, that, that um, our experience gets separated from, from our theology. Um, Hunter von Balthasar has a, has a lovely essay on, on sanctity and theology. I forget, I think that may be the title even, um, of Theology and Sanctity, something like that, um, where he traces some of this to, to about, about this time period. So, so the, the language of, of experience is absolutely ubiquitous among the especially 12th century authors who, who, uh, whom I especially draw on 
in this book. And it's not without danger, actually, I think. Um, because experience, uh, when it is sought for, for its own sake, uh, can become s separated from, um, fr from um, God, can actually become navel-gazing. So there's a danger, I think, in it. Um, second thing I, may, I maybe should say is, al although, oh no, let me put it this way. Second thing is, um, wh wherever we see the presence of God, we 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 have we contemplate. Um, uh, Maxim is a confessor. A confessor, for example, talks about seeing the the ideas or the logoi um, in the natural world. Um, he, he calls it um, fusike um, theoria, fusike theoria, natural contemplation, um, see, seeing the divine ideas that are in God's mind, the, the logoi within within the purposes that God has with things, in, in things themselves. We see God in other people as well, contemplate God in other people. So in the natural world, in other people, and hopefully uh, we see something of God also in our own lives. And the, 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 we're not bereft of the spirit, hopefully. And, and the way in which we live shows signs of God's grace in our lives. So in all of those ways, um, we see God at work. We can't and we shouldn't separate meditation and contemplation from, from one another. Um, wherever God is at work, we may contemplate uh, God being at work. We see something of the face of God. Again, seeing the face of God is not, oh, now I see him, now I do not. No, uh, the, the face of God can be discerned in varying degrees of intensities because there are varying degrees of participation. That, that's an encouragement, especially, I think, for people who, who figure, like myself, who figure, um, oh, what St. Bernard talks about here in terms of being wrapped into the third heaven, I haven't actually experienced. Um, um, be faithful, don't worry about that because the experience itself, um, although a great gift, uh, is something that will be yours um, in the eschaton. And whatever God gives here in his grace is what, whatever, whatever it is that you need in your particular situation. Um, now it is true, in, in addition to that, it is true, of course, that a number of, of these spiritual writers that I talk about in the book uh, did have um, uh, an experience that you cannot but describe as, as ecstatic. Um, that is to say, being taken out of the body, as it were. St. Paul talks about that in 2 Corinthians 12, 3, and being taken up into paradise, the third heaven. Um, um, uh, numerous, numerous, especially in the East more in the East, perhaps more so than in the West. But, but, but there are those those descriptions um, uh, that that punctuate, I think, the history of 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 spirituality in in both East and West, where where there is what you could say what the disciples had when they saw the transfigured Lord. Um, they saw his divine glory, and it is it is a most unique, unique um, um, anticipation of the hereafter. And, and but but often some of these same authors, like Saint Bernard, for example, will lament that they cannot speak of experience of 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 that of that reality. And it seems to me we should not we should not despair. Um, the scriptures, the tradition. Well, the tradition, not uniformly, but certainly the scriptures, give us no reason or, or, or no justification for such despair. Instead, they, they, they remind us time and again um, to, to trust that what we now see by faith, we shall then see by sight, as St. As Paul in, in 2 Corinthians 4, 6. Amen. Amen. Well, Hans, thank you so much for joining us today. We want to just, as we're wrapping up here, maybe you can be thinking about what what would be the takeaway? What would be the, the nutshell that you could wrap this up in? And uh, uh, for our viewers, just the one thing that, 
uh, that they could take home with them. And uh, Josh, if you have something too, I'll just I'll just share that Hans. You know, for one, we so we come from different streams, different different traditions. So I enjoy reading your stuff because for one, I end up learning a whole lot about church history, uh, which I really appreciate. And uh, and also, you just really challenge my thinking. You put new wrinkles in my brain, and um, I would say that on this this specific specifically with Lectio Divina, uh, I think what what I appreciate about the approach is um, it, is that the real aim is to encounter God, and and mm -hmm. what a better aim like with the Scripture to encounter God. I mean, when we when we encounter God, when we look to Him, that Second Corinthians three eighteen, we're transformed from glory to glory, or or First John uh, three uh, verses, really one to three, uh, but but where it, it talks about our hope in Jesus and His return, which you refer to as the as the beatific vision and seeing in, in God's face. But uh, but He has this hope in Him, purifies Himself, so that when when God becomes the goal of the scripture and not just learning a new thing, not just my Bible reading habit, uh, I, I think it, it helps center us and say, you know what, this is, this is what this is about. I am, I am reading my Bible to grow closer to God, to know him more fully, more intimately, not just to know things about him, although I welcome that. And I think the Lectio Divina with its its reading stage, it says, hey, it is important to learn facts and to learn things and all of that, but to press it more deeply to its, you use the word telos, to its end, to know God, to see his face, and that we can catch a glimpse of the beatific vision in this life through the reading of scripture. Uh, I think it, it challenges me and challenges us. So I appreciate that mm -hmm. about uh, about your work and about your interview today. So thank you for that. Uh, no, Josh, you. did you have any, did you have anything you wanted to, to add? Man, I, I think that your, your insights were good. I think for our specific audience, because there's so much crossover between Christian theology and the charismatic movement, I think so much of the charismatic space leans so much on experience untethered from being biblically rooted. And I think that, uh, though, though there's still a little bit more searching and wrestling through this Lectio process that. That I find extremely interesting. I do what I admire about it. To your point, you said I admire about it that its aim is to encounter God. I admire about it that it is very scripturally tethered. It's I'm going to read the Bible. I'm going to think about the Bible. I'm going to pray about the Bible. I'm going to meditate about the Bible. And 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 the hopeful aim is that God would catch me up um, into an experience of these truths. And. And, I, and again, I would say as much as it is uh, about encountering God, it is as much rooted in Scripture. And, and I think for the charismatic space right now, being so hungry for an encounter, often that is so divorced from the biblical context, that the kind of maybe danger that Hans was speaking of earlier, and I don't want to put words in his mouth, he wasn't talking about the charismatic movement. Um, but, but I do see a kind of drivenness for experience that's so divorced from history and theology uh, and healthy biblical uh, study and rigor. So uh, I would say the same thing that you would contend for on the one side of the, the, the spectrum, I would, I would say is equally as beautiful on the other side that it's so deeply rooted in the scripture. Hans, what kind of takeaways, gold nuggets would you want our, our community thinking about as they're walking away from a video like this? Yeah, thank you both for this comment. They're very helpful. Um, very helpful as I'm thinking about, about this, especially what you mentioned about the, the charismatic or Pentecostal um, um, approach to these things. Um, that, that, that's the first, that, that makes me think of the first takeaway, I guess. Um, a sacramental reading of scripture is actually very consonant, I think, with, with at least aspects of, of the Pentecostal tradition. I'm often struck, um, by emails that I get from Pentecostal readers or, or, or PhD students or what, or whatnot. Um, Who've, who've read something that I've written and, and, and who've, who somehow somehow find, find it echoing with their own tradition. And I, I think the reason for that is that um, both in, in say, the, the Catholic and, and, and Orthodox and the tradition and in the earlier tradition, the great tradition of the church, there's this, this sense of divine imminence, um, God's, God's real presence. And, and imminence, of course, is, is, is a huge thing within, within the Pentecostal tradition. So I think there is a, 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 a touch point, as it were, 
um, between the earlier tradition and, and Pentecostalism. And, and, and it seems to me that uh, Pentecostalism um, 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 w- would find a natural, natural um, ally, as it were, in this, in this um, notion of, of God's imminence and in this notion of God making himself present sacramentally uh, in the great tradition. So that's, that's one thing that I, I, have, I have noticed over, over the last number of years. And the other, other point, the other takeaway is this, um, for me in terms of Lectio Divina itself, uh, and that's speaking more personally, and, and I think also culturally, um, that is, it reminds us it reminds me um, that that um, at the end of the day, only one thing matters, um, and that is that you know Matthew five eight, the pure in heart shall see God. Only at the end of the day, only one thing matters, um, and that is to contemplate God. Um, we, we live in a culture that 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 pulls us away from that and that wants to make us, if nothing else, just thoroughly at home in this world, um, thoroughly at home in, 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 in uh, earthly things. Um, for, for the tradition of the church, earthly things, while, while, God's, while they are God's good gifts, um, are, are only penultimate, they're not ultimate. Um, they, they, they are meant as, as stepping stones, as it were, good stepping stones, to be sure, but only as stepping stones um, toward our heavenly future. And um, uh, divine reading, Lectio Divina, um, ke- keeps us focused on, our, on that ultimate telos. Amen. That's super good. Uh, Hans, thank you so much for coming on to the program. For those of you who are out there, check out Pierced by Love. Uh, this is the book that we've been talking about today. Lots of really great content that you can find in that book. And if you're out there and you want to support the channel, links in the description. You have a top link for PayPal and a bottom link there for Patreon. Also, a quick reminder for our audience, we do have the Word and Spirit School of Ministry that's open. We've got endorsements from guys like Sam Storms, Jack Deere, Mike Bickle. Uh, lots of really great content that can be found there uh, over at the link of the description. Uh, bottom link there is the Word and Spirit School of Ministry. You can find more information there about classes and registration. Uh, We do have Wednesday classes open or Monday classes filled up real quick. Uh, But for the rest of those classes, they're going to be on the weekends. They're on Saturdays. But you can find all that information and more there at the link in the description. Hope you guys had uh, as much fun as I did with Hans. And we'll see you next Wednesday uh, from 4 to 5 p.m. Central Standard Time. Blessings.